Hi, everyone. This is Chris Ye, the co-author of Blitzscaling. I'm delighted to be here with you today, and I am looking forward to meeting some of you at our Scaling Bootcamp in partnership with MIT in September. What I'm going to do today is talk about some of the key lessons that you can learn from Blitzscaling companies. And throughout this presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the iconic companies that have Blitzscaled and try to extract some key lessons from their story. I'm going to be covering some of the companies that you know very well uh, from the world of the consumer internet, but I'm also going to branch out. We're going to cover companies from different geographies. We're going to cover companies from different industries because it's very important to understand the different ways that blitzscaling might apply and that you can learn different lessons from different companies. And at the very end, if we have time, what I'll do is I'll let you guys actually suggest companies. I don't necessarily know every single company in the world, but if it is a well-known company, I'll let you suggest companies. And I'll give you my thoughts on that company. For example, uh, right before this, I was actually giving my thoughts to the organizers on WeWork. I did a little analysis of the S1, and it turns out that in order for WeWork to reach break even on its business, it needs an occupancy rate of 160%. So if you're currently a WeWork user, you can pretty much expect to ask that they'll be asking you to let people sit in your lap soon. So, uh, and I see people are already coming in and putting in questions. That's awesome. Uh, I will come back to them in a bit. <laughs> okay, awesome questions coming out already about uh, pricing and things like that. Also a, a great topic. Uh, I'll definitely try to come back to that and I'll see if I can touch on pricing along the way. So again, let's get started. Feel free to ask your questions at any time. And if Misty barks, well, She's a cute little dog, rest assured, and we'll just get through it. So let's begin and talk about Blitzscaling. Let me get back to <laughs> screen sharing stopped. The slideshow came off. Now let's try to get it going again. All right, uh, please confirm that the sharing is working. Let me get the, let me pop up the chat window. Great. So can you guys confirm that the screen sharing is working for me just in the quick chat? That would be great. Working. Fantastic. All right. Now let's try to actually go through this. Am I clicking on this? It should. Jeez. Okay. That is very strange. Um, having trouble getting the screen share to work. Don't worry. We should be able to make this work without a problem. I'm going to just try this again. I'll do a slightly different thing. <laughs> PowerPoint slideshow, yes, good. And pop up the chat. Uh, I, I'll, I will mention the WeWork break even uh, as we speak. So this should do like this. Yes, <laughs> technology. So the first company I'd like to talk about is, of course, Amazon. And Amazon is this iconic blitzscaling company that has done some pretty incredible things over the years. And I often love to use Amazon as an illustration because the growth that Amazon has gone through is absolutely incredible. And Amazon is actually a fascinating blitzscaling story because it lacks many of the characteristics that we would typically think are necessary for blitzscaling. It is the genius of Jeff Bezos that's been able to do it anyways. So let's dial back in time and think about Amazon in 1996. In 1996, Amazon was a relatively small online bookstore. It was called Amazon Books, and it sold something on the order of $5 million of books in the year 1996. That made it you know, very big for a bookstore. Your average corner bookstore is not going to sell $5 million worth of books but still very tiny in the grand scheme of things. And certainly at that point in time, it was difficult to say that this would someday be the most valuable company in the world, the most valuable retailer in the world, and a company that is basically responsible for changing our lives. And what happened was Amazon was actually able to grow at this incredible rate. And in fact, the company went from 5 million in revenues to 1.6 billion in revenues by 1999. And it's that kind of incredible growth that reflects both the power and the promise of blitzscaling, which is to say the ability to pursue rapid growth by prioritizing speed over efficiency 
in an environment of uncertainty. In 1996, it was far from certain that e-commerce was going to develop into what it is today. In fact, at that time, a lot of people said, wow, people are never going to buy things online. Are they going to be willing to put their credit card into a website? Is it secure? Now, this, of course, was silly because every day in America, for example, people hand their credit cards to a server at a restaurant who then carries it off and could very well be making replicas of it for the dark net uh, when they carry it away. And yet we have that kind of trust and without necessarily there being any justification for it. And so online commerce certainly was going to make sense as well. The credit card company is going to step up and pursue anti-fraud, and it was going to work out in the long run. But Jeff Bezos was the one who said, I'm willing to process through this uncertainty. I'm willing to grow extremely aggressively in order to get to this kind of scale. And achieving this kind of scale allowed Amazon to do a lot of other things. So the thing about scale is, Scale has to be for a purpose. Blitzscaling isn't just growth for growth's sake. Blitzscaling is growth for the sake of competitive advantage. And so the question was, what was the competitive advantage that Amazon was able to be able to do? Uh, so in the first stage of Amazon, the second phase involves AWS, and we'll definitely talk about that. Sorcerer Stone mentioned AWS, and I'll be getting to that. But during the first phase of growth of Amazon, Amazon's characteristics were actually similar to companies in emerging markets. Why do I say that? Well, it's because the e-commerce market at that point was an emerging market. Amazon had to build everything from scratch. There was no such thing as Shopify. There was no such thing as Stripe. There was no way to do all these things. You had to build your own payment gateway. You had to build your own online e-commerce system. And what's interesting about emerging markets, and we'll talk about this later on in the context of a couple of companies, is that while being forced to build your own infrastructure at the beginning, will slow you down because you can only grow so fast. You're limited by your infrastructure and infrastructure investments. It actually accelerates your growth later on because that infrastructure becomes a competitive advantage. And so Amazon very quickly, by investing heavily in infrastructure, developed a competitive advantage. And in fact, by the time that the dot-com era was in full bloom in 1999, Amazon, in addition to its core e-commerce business, was also beginning to handle e-commerce for other people like Target. So Target, for example, signed a big deal to allow Amazon to do its e-commerce initiatives. Later on, of course, Target realized that they were basically signing their own death warrant and created their own e-commerce operation. But that, at that point, Amazon's grasp of logistics, its ability to handle e-commerce, meant that one of the biggest retailers in the world, Target, turned to Amazon for its help in going out to the market. And so that illustrates one of the principles of blitzscaling, which is that one of the key growth limiters is operational scalability, the ability to handle that rapid growth. But if you are able to develop an expertise in operational scalability, you can turn it from a growth limiter to something that actually powers your growth. And that's how Amazon ultimately built up its business. So when you buy something from Amazon today, let's say you go to amazon.com and you buy something, uh, a significant chunk of the sales you make are not held in Amazon, are not fulfilled by Amazon, or they're fulfilled by Amazon, but they're not purchased from Amazon. Amazon is not holding that inventory. In fact, it's third party sellers like a Target or like the millions of smaller independent sellers who are willing to sell on Amazon, who pay Amazon to have their products in Amazon warehouses so that they can be shipped out via Amazon Prime for next day or two day delivery. And that ability to leverage that operational scalability is what's made Amazon's retail business so successful. And that retail business, of course, is enormously valuable today. But, and this gets to the point that Sorcerer Stone mentioned, in many ways, Amazon's greatest value proposition right now is Amazon Web Services. And Amazon Web Services is a fascinating story. I like to point out to people in my talks with like large corporations, I'll put up a slide and I'll say, you know, imagine this company. It has 17,000, uh, it has uh, 17,000 employees. It has a 10 billion in revenues. It has a market cap of $20 billion. And I say, that feels like a well-established company. That's probably a company that's already finished with most of its growth, right? And the answer is wrong. 
because those numbers describe Amazon in 2006 when it first introduced the first component of AWS, which was S3, uh, their simple storage solution. And by becoming the pioneer in cloud computing, Amazon was again leveraging its expertise in operational scalability. Amazon had already become the world's leading e-commerce player, had built some of the world's most efficient data centers. And Amazon said, well, you know what? We could actually rent this out. And it's a fascinating story, by the way. This was not some initiative that came top down that Jeff Bezos said, I have this brilliant idea. In fact, it was some low to mid-level Amazon employees who came up with the idea of leveraging, leveraging Amazon's infrastructure, wrote a memo, convinced Jeff Bezos to back it. Jeff deserves credit for backing it. The board thought he was crazy. What are you doing? We got this great e-commerce business. Why are you going to get into providing computing infrastructure? That is nuts. And in fact, I like to show a cover of Business Week from 2006, where Business Week says, Jeff Bezos wants to run your computing infrastructure. Wall Street thinks he should just mind the store. And the whole story is about why they think Amazon Web Services is a bad idea. Not a good look for Business Week, as it turns out, which is why they eventually were bought by Bloomberg and are a shadow of their former selves. So Amazon, of course, did introduce Amazon Web Services. And Amazon Web Services is the runaway leader in cloud computing. And AWS is, in fact, a classic blitzscaling business that shows all the characteristics. So let's think about it. Is there a big market for cloud computing? Absolutely. Market. Check. Is there a great distribution strategy for Amazon Web Services? Absolutely. Amazon Web Services uh, is just something that you can come and sign up for online. It's self-service. It's really easy for any developer in the world to get started. Amazon tries to make it as friction-free as possible. And in addition to everything else, it has the Amazon brand going for it. So distribution, check. And Amazon then partners with various incubators and things like that. They give away Amazon Web Services credits for free. Why? Guess what? It's the same reason that cocaine dealers give away their first hit for free. They know you're going to keep using it. Next up, gross margins. Gross margins for Amazon Web Services are classic software gross margins, 60, 70, 80 percent in comparison to the much lower 10, 20 percent retail margins. So Amazon Web Services is a great business because it has high gross margins, which help feed the growth. And in fact, a number of years ago, I would make a lot of hay by asking people, what percentage of Amazon's operating profit do you think comes from AWS? This was like probably three years ago or so. Does anyone want to care, uh, take a guess? Like in 2016, what percentage of Amazon's operating margin, operating profits came from AWS? Anyone want to guess? Just take, just guess a number, any number, 60%. So the answer from, and that's from Lissansro, uh, the answer, again, for some number uses 80%, 75, the answer was 150%. And the reason is that uh, Amazon, its retail business was losing money and Amazon Web Services was making money. And so it actually represented 150%. Uh, this is a trick that I realized back when I was in business school. In business school, we were having a class, a finance class, and somebody asked, what percentage of the industry's profits do you think Frito-Lay represents in the chip industry? And people were guessing, you know, 60%, 80%, 50%, 40%. And I'm like, this is a trick question. So I raised my hand and I said, 125%. Turns out the answer was 120. So I was a little off on my guess, but I could see where things were coming from. So AWS is an incredible business. The, fine, the fourth factor, of course, are the network effects. And let's talk about the network effects and why those network effects help AWS relative to Azure and Google. So Sorcerer Stone asks, from your POV, what's the unique value proposition of AWS and how does it compare to those offerings from Azure and Google? And the answer is the network effects that Amazon has built. So Amazon has made AWS the leading platform. And they meet, that means that People are very familiar with AWS, who was the first out of the box. It has been the market leader the entire time. And so if you're trying to find third parties who have built on the platform, if you're trying to find developers who are familiar with the platform, AWS is the runaway leader. Now, Azure has actually been enormously successful. It's leveraging a different factor, which is that a lot of companies are Microsoft shops. A lot of companies are interested in hybrid cloud, i.e. some on-premise and some cloud. And because Microsoft 
has such great account control among enterprises, Azure makes sense for them because AWS, while it can work in a hybrid cloud environment, and they've done things like, um, you know, uh, do the big projects for the government that are on premise, uh, Azure is just ready to do that out of the box and it works with your existing Microsoft infrastructure. Google has probably struggled the most in this area because it doesn't have that natural benefit of either being the market leader like AWS has or the account control that uh, Microsoft has, which is probably why Google is is well is in third or fourth place overall, and it's really a two horse race with AWS probably in an insurmountable lead, but with Microsoft with a good strong second place business. So, uh, finishing the discussion of Amazon Web Services and the factors that it contribute to blitz scaling, we mentioned network effects. The final thing is product market fit. And there's no question that Amazon Web Services has achieved product market fit. It is the default answer. And Amazon works hard to keep it the default answer. How do they do that? By making sure they continue to innovate the product, continue to bring out new features and new ways to make it better. And second, Amazon follows one of the strategies that it's difficult for other people to follow, but that Jeff Bezos has followed with T, which is they proactively ra continue to lower the costs of Amazon Web Services, just as they proactively continue to lower the costs of goods on Amazon. As Jeff Bezos likes to say, your margin is my opportunity. Amazon has the ability to finance itself thanks to the vast flood of cash from Amazon Web Services and the ability for Amazon to raise money in the public markets quite easily. And Jeff Bezos has deliberately avoided trying to maximize profits in order to maximize growth. And that is fine when people believe and trust you that your pursuit of growth is smart. And over the years, the two decades plus, Jeff Bezos has proven himself worthy of that trust. And he can exploit that in ways that other people can't. Uh, so a couple of questions just while we're here. I want to I want to tap into uh, the questions before we go too much further because there's going to be so many chat windows that I won't be able to see it all. Uh, there was a quick question about pricing. So uh, th I think Amazon answers that question. You don't price oops. You don't price the service according to your competitors. You price the service according to the value of the customer. And more importantly, you can use price as a strategic advantage. If you are able to underprice your competitors, you can basically perform a cashectomy on them and drive them out of business. Once upon a time, this was actually Microsoft's principal uh, competitive advantage. They would just go ahead and give things away for free because they had so much money coming to them from the Windows and Office franchises. Uh, this is less the case today. Uh, but even so, people like Amazon even though they don't give away things for free, they minimize the margin for competitive advantage. And I do think that you should not rely on your customers to tell you what the price is. Uh, the pri my best pricing advice is, first of all, keep it simple complicated pricing schemes made sense the old enterprise sales world where you'd spend six months making a sale and it was for on-premise software and the, com the complicatedness of these schemes is absolutely insane keep it simple keep it straightforward no we don't optimize for like every last percentage point just keep it simple and easy to understand and what you want to do is you want to pursue what i call flinch pricing and flinch pricing, if you can do it, is very simple. You just go to someone, you say, well, you know, how much does it cost? Oh, it costs uh, $100 per seat, per month, per integration. And you keep adding different qualifiers until the person visibly flinches. And that's when you know that they won't meet the price anymore. Uh, so a little bit of flinch pricing. It's, a, it's an oldie but a goodie. I, I always enjoy that quite a bit. Um, and the, I think that the person Sorcerer Stone is asking, hey, my initial targets are corporate clients and high, highly regulated industry. It's all RFP, multiple rounds of filtering and presentation. It, it makes it difficult to blitz scale growth. Uh, and as a result, how do you do that? So I think that, the, again, blitz scaling growth, this is an interesting thing that people often think. They think blitz scaling is a specific speed. Blitz scaling is not a specific speed. You don't have to double every year or triple every year to be blitz scaling. What you need to do is to grow faster than your competitors. So if you are stuck going through the RFP process, but all your competitors are stuck going through the RFP process, that doesn't necessarily prohibit you from blitz scaling. What you're looking for are the edges that will allow you to move faster than others. So for example, 
uh, one of the tactics I've used in responding to RFPs is I do a lot of research on the people who are actually involved in the decision making process. And if we do a demonstration, I use their actual photographs, I use their actual projects, things that they're working on. The less people have to visualize something, the easier it is for them to say yes. Uh, is that specifically a blitzscaling technique? No, it's just a good sales technique in general. Where it becomes a blitzscaling technique is if it allows you to move faster. Uh, at LinkedIn, for example, uh, we're not going to talk about LinkedIn specifically today, but this is a great example. I've heard a lot of cool stories from my co-author, Reid Hoffman, who's the co-founder of LinkedIn. One of the things LinkedIn did in selling its recruiter product is they actually built a tool that would automatically create sales decks for the individual company in question. So they could tell that the individual company was a good prospect and you could push a button as a salesperson, it would create a sales deck for you. Incredible, right? What does it do? Two things, you get the sales deck faster and two, there are more proposals that are gonna go out because if otherwise you might be limited to the number of sales decks that people produce and they're customized and they speak specifically to what's going on. So that's a great example of something that LinkedIn did that was able to make it work. Um, how do I get to 160% for WeWork to be break even? 160% uh, 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 occupancy? Very simple. What I did is I looked at WeWork and said, what is their current what are their what are their numbers look like and in the first half of 2009 WeWork had revenues of about 1.5 billion dollars which is great i mean that's on track for 3 billion dollars and they had losses of 1.4 billion dollars so in other words revenue of 1.5 billion loss uh, expenses of 2.9 billion by the way that operating loss is actually um, uh, just based on operations of course they're doing financing and things like that and so looking at it i said well we work needs to double its revenue in order to achieve break even and we work reports that their occupancy rate is 80 percent so they got two choices either they have to somehow raise the prices and charge more per square foot get people to pay more or somehow cram people in more densely or they're going to have to get 160 percent occupancy rate which means you know 60 percent of the people will be sitting on someone else's lap so that's going to be troublesome it's going to be difficult i really i really like elements of the we work model i like the idea of being able to get people into greater density getting people happier to work in smaller spaces that is very powerful very efficient uh, but the way they're going about it doesn't seem to economically work right now. So hopefully they'll be able to figure out a way to make it work. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think I've answered most of those questions. Last question is how to blitz scale in tech regulation and compliance are very different between countries. Yes. So this is absolutely uh, another issue. Uh, if you're in a regulated industry, it does tend to slow you down, but it tends to slow everyone else down as well. So what I tend to do is I say what you want to do is you want to focus on blitz scaling within a specific market where the regulations are the same because you're going to have to make that investment up front in figuring out the regulations and compliance. And what you want to do is you don't want to spread yourself so thin that you are attempting to achieve a critical scale in five different markets at once. Achieve critical scale in a market, then move on to the next market. So do it in a sequential rather than parallel fashion. Uh, of course, it would be great to do it in a parallel fashion, but it's rare that you have the resources and the attention to do it. So great set of questions. We'll keep asking these questions along the way. I don't think I'm going to get to all my slides, but that's okay because hopefully we are, um, hopefully we're getting some great content here. So next, I want to talk a little bit about Facebook. So the interesting thing about Facebook, well, there are many interesting things, including some negative things, but that's not the focus of today. Uh, the interesting thing about Facebook is figuring out how, in blitz scaling, one of the things you need to do in blitz scaling is to be able to actually figure out how you can multi thread. And what I mean by multi thread is within blitz scaling, it's not like you just have a single product and a single thing that you're doing throughout the entirety of your company. Uh, that's very rare. There are a few examples of that. Craigslist is the one that comes to mind, really hasn't changed in the entire time it's existed. But Facebook has had to make some major changes. And it reveals why companies need to keep innovating, even if they've been successful in a particular market, if they want to stay on top. So Facebook rose to prominence as a desktop 
web-based social network, something that came out in the early 2000s. It spread rapidly on college campuses. It has this incredible network effect because it's a communications medium. They pioneered the new business model of the news feed, which is critical, right? Uh, if it were just a static profile page, which is what it began as, by the way, it doesn't have nearly the same impact. A static profile page, you can throw up some ads, but why do people go there? The news feed means that people are addicted and keep coming back over and over again. And by the way, you can now put sponsored posts in that feed and drive engagement and drive that money engine that makes Facebook so successful. So there are some key innovations that Facebook made in terms of the news feed business model that allowed it to be so successful. But Facebook eventually ended up at a crossroads. And the reason is that even though they were continue to dominate the desktop web, they were facing the problem of what to do about mobile. And it's no surprise that we have slowly moved from a desktop world to a mobile world. And in fact, web traffic is probably about 70 to 80% mobile at this point. And Facebook had actually made an unfortunate choice. Uh, this was an unfortunate choice, which actually hit me because one of my companies made the same choice saying, well, Facebook CTO did this, therefore we should do it. And that was to not build a native app for the iPhone or Android, but to rely on responsive web. And there was based on HTML5 and there were reasons for it because it's easier to develop and all this sort of things. But the point was it was the wrong decision. People use the mobile web, but for an app that is as central to their life as Facebook, they want to use it in a native app environment, which is going to deliver a better user experience. And so what was required for Facebook to get to mobile? Well, there were two major things that they did. The first is that Mark Zuckerberg said, we are going to turn the battleship. We are going to go mobile first. And what that means is the following. First of all, Whenever somebody comes to present to me, they need to present the mobile side of it first. If they don't, I'm going to send them away and I'm not going to listen to them. And in a, in a, a company where only one person's opinion truly matters, and that's Mark Zuckerberg's, that is a tremendous incentive to focus on mobile. The second thing is Mark Zuckerberg said, we are going to freeze all new feature development. We are not going to develop any new features for desktop until we've got our native mobile app to parity. And this is huge, right? Having a company take two years out of its product roadmap is incredible. But that was something that Mark Zuckerberg could do because he has full governance control over the company, but also because everyone knows at Facebook, it is his decision. He's the one who controls the direction of the company. And it ended up being wildly successful. Facebook, of course, is now more used on mobile than ever. And in addition, it did its second thing, which is Facebook has Facebook and Facebook Messenger, and it also purchased Instagram and WhatsApp using Facebook's financial might to uh, basically buy into the mobile market with two of the most important services. Uh, believe me, Facebook would have bought Snapchat too if Snapchat were willing to sell. Uh, it, it is a great example of taking the financial might of the company and being able to do things that at the time people thought were crazy, but in retrospect were incredible bargains. Instagram was a $1 billion purchase and people thought it was crazy because it was a company that had just launched 18 months prior and really was making no money. Guess what? Does anyone think that it was a bad idea for Facebook to buy Instagram now? No, I don't think so. And WhatsApp was similar. They paid $22 billion for WhatsApp because WhatsApp, even though WhatsApp was barely making any money, but WhatsApp had become this monster both here in the United States and around the world. And in fact, most of you probably use WhatsApp as well. And Facebook has cornered the market on the small group messaging in WhatsApp, the individual one-to-one -one messaging in Facebook Messenger, and the ability to sort of share photos and videos in Instagram. And just brilliant, brilliant strategy on the part of Mark Zuckerberg. It may be a while before you guys reach that point, but it is important to note that even if you are that successful, you are going to need to remain nimble. You're going to need to the ability to say, you know what, we can't just rely on the one trick that got us here. We've got to keep finding new ways, whether we're bringing them in internally, like Mark Zuckerberg did by forcing the shift to mobile, or bringing them in externally by acquisition. Uh, let's see. Another question came in, which was, uh, so another question came in, how can early stage startups consider both consumer 
pre-bit scaling, consider both consumer and enterprise drive awareness for the products, assuming they cannot afford paid advertisement. So uh, I'm going to sidebar. This is not specifically blitz scaling because it's the pre-blitz scaling phase, but I will give you free of charge uh, the approach that I think works the best. And I've given this advice to many people. Not everyone follows it, but I think it. every time people have followed it, I think it's worked every time. So the most important thing to drive awareness for your products is to figure out who are the set of influencers in your space. And a lot of times people look at driving awareness, which is a marketing challenge, and I'm a marketing specialist. They look at it as there's a set of tools. Uh, I need to hire a PR firm and get press. I need to go out and brief analysts. Now, there are definitely things you need to do. Like if you're an enterprise company, you're, gonna get, you're going to need to brief analysts. If you're a consumer company, you need to figure out a strategy for paid advertising as well. But the most important thing in a social media world, and it's only become more and more important, is to understand who are the influential voices in your space and to begin developing your relationship with those voices before you launch. So uh, just to give you an example of this, um, one of the big, one of the big uh, entrepreneurial successes I've had in my life is helping to launch Ustream, which is a live video company. Uh, it sadly uh, ultimately ended up being the number two to Twitch, which meant instead of selling to Amazon for $1 billion, we sold it to IBM for $130 million, which is still good, but not quite as nice as a billion. As, as Sean Parker says in The Social Network, you know what's cool? A billion dollars. That's cool. Uh, but what we did was very much an influencer play, figuring out who were the people in the industry who already had the greatest audiences, who had the greatest influences, and courting them and developing relationships with them. And these are folks like Leo Laporte, as well as um, uh, the, the Locker Gnome, Chris uh, over at Locker Gnome, and so on and so forth. And you can actually do this retail politicking in a very effective way as a founder because people like to hear from a founder. People like to hear uh, straight up from the person there. Uh, so building up that influence is really important. And, you know, one is developing those relationships. The other is making yourself an influencer. So if you're in a particular space, write about that space, podcast about that space, blog about the space, become an influencer yourself. Both those things are really important in today's world, both on the consumer side and the enterprise side. And that's even if you can't afford $20,000 a month for a PR firm or to spend $20,000 a month on search ads. Uh, that was a question from Arjun. Uh, Sorcerer Stone asks, very Good participation, Sorcerer Stone. Uh, when Mark insisted on achieving mobile parity, was the board of the company on board for this drastic act? How did Mark convince the board and his staff this was the right decision? So there are two things. One is Mark was able to use data to just very clearly state, hey, we're falling behind on mobile, and you can see the direction that mobile is going in. And the second is when you have a super majority of thanks to uh, multi-class shares, and Mark Zuckerberg can actually do anything he wants. Uh, any board vote, he technically wins it because he can dispose of the board at any time just using his uh, supermajority shares. So he essentially has dictatorial control. So that also helps. But, you know, I think that even then, I think he generally tries to actually convince people of, of what to do. Uh, here's something from Junior VC. We're a small but growing online university in LATAM. We know we can grow more. If this is a market that's worth the effort to scale, if you see we should change market or product to something more technology intensive. So uh, I think that online education could very well be a big market. The intersection of online education in Latin America may or may not be big enough now. It will be big enough someday. And not knowing specifically whether this is the biggest, I think it boils down to ask yourself the question, what are the things that need to be true in order for this market to be worth it to us? And then go down the list of those assumptions and see how they're checking out and what uh, evidence would lead you to conclude that, yes, this is definitely true, or what evidence would lead you to conclude, no, this isn't true. Because at the end of the day, it's all about whether or not you're convinced. Don't worry about convincing investors. Uh, you'll have to do that eventually. But more importantly is, are you yourself convinced? If you get too caught up in what investors think or what other people think, you may start to lose sight of what you yourself believe. And ultimately, what you believe is the most important. So let me keep going because there's so many more great companies to talk about and we have so little time. Oh my God, I totally underestimated how long it would take. Uh, next up, 
Airbnb, a company which is just enormously successful. There's so many great stories to be told from Airbnb. Uh, but the one that I tell in the book that is probably the most relevant is how competition drives blitz scaling. And the story we tell in the book comes from early in the history of Airbnb, after it had gotten traction, was starting to do well, but before it was the giant that it was today. Uh, at the time, and this was roughly 2010, Airbnb was a 40 person company that basically operated in the United States. And it was getting good traction, it had raised some money, uh, but it was not the giant it is today. And what happened is at that point in time, the Somver brothers in Germany who run Rocket Internet, whose business model is cloning other people's companies and extorting them, decided that this was a great thing to go after. So they put a hundred million dollars into something called Vimdu, which was their Airbnb clone in Europe, hired 400 people in order to actually run the company. So they were literally 10 times the size of Airbnb, opened 20 different offices across Europe so they could expand across Europe as quickly as possible, and then reached out to Airbnb and said, hey, we'll do a merger and we can merge these companies in exchange for 25% of Airbnb's equity. So this is a tough decision for the founders of Airbnb led by their CEO, Brian Chesky, because Airbnb is a travel company. And as a travel company, you have to be able to win Europe as well as the United States. There's so much travel that goes on between the US and Europe. Travel companies have to ultimately be global if they're going to succeed, especially a company like Airbnb. And so they had to figure out, should they give in to this extortion or should they fight? And the thing about this is, remember, this kind of a market, Airbnb, is a two-sided marketplace for hosts and guests. And with a two-sided marketplace, there's really strong network effects. So whoever achieves critical scale of first tends to be the one that stays on top. That's why eBay is still on top after all these years, despite barely even changing its interface or service. So Airbnb knew that it couldn't afford to let them do basically dominate Europe. Airbnb had to dominate Europe in order to succeed in its objectives. But it was facing off against a competitor. It just had so much money. It was moving so quickly. And they hadn't intended to expand very quickly either. So the question was, what did they do? Well, the answer is they said, you know what? This is one of those moments, the decisive moment where we have to decide you know, is our objective to be the global player or not? Is our objective to dominate this industry or not? And their objective was to do that. And they felt that ultimately they could beat Vimdu because Vimdu was a company of mercenaries where it essentially was just, you know, hacked together by the rocket internet guys. Whereas Airbnb is a company of missionaries, people who really believed in what they were doing and really believed in the product and loved running the company and building the product and building the business. So they said, you know what? Screw those guys. We're going to raise our own money and we're going to up the pace of expansion to match them and we're going to beat them at their own game. And that's precisely what they did. Airbnb had raised about $10 million to that point. Very quickly, they raised another 40 or 50 million. They opened up offices across Europe. And by the time, uh, the, uh, by, by basically that next year, uh, Airbnb had increased its number of bookings by a factor of 10x thanks to this aggressive expansion platform. And ultimately, that aggressive expansion allowed Airbnb to achieve critical mass and accelerated the pace. Airbnb might be a year further behind if it weren't for that competitor pushing them to pick up the pace. Now, what are the key lessons to learn from this? The first is it's all about the competition. As the old saying goes, if two friends are in the woods and they encounter an angry grizzly bear, one friend starts to run. The first second friend says, why are you running? Uh, you know, you can't possibly outrun that angry bear. And the first friend says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And blitz scaling is a race. You just have to outrun your competitors. And you have to find a way to outrun them, whatever it takes. It may involve raising money. It may involve being more aggressive. It may be uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, you can't allow them to reach critical scale before you do. Otherwise, they will win. And it doesn't matter how efficient you've been along the way. The second thing is it really is important 
to have that mission in mind, to have that culture where people really care about the business and really care about building a great product. Just having people care about money is not enough because sooner or later, someone will come along and offer them more money or greater opportunity and those people will leave and you will not have the ability to build the business that you need to build. Uh, so, yes, so the question was, uh, there are a couple of questions. There's a specific question about Airbnb. When Airbnb made this global expansion initiative, how many people were working with them and how many rounds of investment had they received? At that point in time, Airbnb had 40 employees and they'd received two rounds of investment, a seed investment and a series A, and they had about $10 million. So they had to go out and raise a lot, you know, 40 or $50 million in that next round in a series B in order to compete. It was very expensive. And expanding that quickly was probably less efficient than the steady expansion that they had planned on. But it ultimately allowed them to achieve critical scale that much faster and made it that much more difficult for anyone else to come after them. Uh, sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Uh, Lissansro asks, is it logical to start raising awareness of a B2B product in the product market fit stage? In addition, releasing a beta with a sign-up list, a good idea. So uh, you should... Uh, if you're in the product market fit stage, if you are seeking product market fit, it's not necessarily that important to raise awareness yet. You just need to get the awareness to the point where people can try it out. You only really want to go big after you feel like you've raised product market fit. Now, there is an exception, which is if, in fact, you're locked in a deadly battle with the competition, you can't afford to wait until you see product market fit to go after it. You may have to go out, despite the fact that there is a real possibility without achieving product market fit that both you and your competitor will fail. But if your competitor succeeds, if they bet and bet correctly that product market fit will be achieved and you are more cautious, you will ultimately lose. So it will depend a lot on the competition that's involved. Is releasing a beta with a sign-up list a good idea? Yes, if that beta sign-up list allows you to find people who can try out the product and help you refine the product. There's a famous saying from the book as well as from elsewhere that my co-author Reid Hoffman coined, which is, if you are not embarrassed by your first product launch, you've launched too late. The whole goal is to get feedback from real users. That's the quickest way to get from a not good enough product to a good enough product, not to sit back and, and try to figure out how to achieve perfection in a vacuum. And so having a beta list is fine as long as you're using that beta list to get people who give you real feedback. Just getting names is not that helpful because guess what? When the time comes, you email them. You know, Some percentage of them will no longer be at the email address. A large percentage will have forgotten you. It's better to strike while the iron is hot. Uh, okay, so we have, wow. Time is flying by. Let me at least get through. Uh, uh, let me uh, let me at least get through uh, a couple of these. I'm going to skip over WeChat for a second because I don't have time for them. I'm going to talk briefly about Mercado Libre because some of you may be in markets outside the United States. So Mercado Libre, of course, is a giant e-commerce retailer, among other things, in South in the Latin American market. Uh, obviously, I've already heard that some people are in the LATAM market. I happen to think it's a great market. It's growing very rapidly. Uh, it also has the advantage of being roughly in the same time zone as the United States, and so there is much greater potential for cross-fertilization. Uh, I do think it's growing faster, and it is, uh, I always tell everyone, you know, if you look at the world, there are only a couple of languages that are going to matter. There's English, of course. There's Chinese. There's probably Hindi, and then of course there's Spanish. And having the Spanish language ability is incredible because you have this Latin American market which has all these demographics on its side. All these secular trends are in its favor. But with Mercado Libre, it very much was like Amazon in the early days. But there was no infrastructure, no equivalent of UPS, no equivalent of uh, a visa in the sense that a lot of people were unbanked, a lot of the potential customers were unbanked. Uh, so Mercado Libre actually had to create its own delivery system, had to create its own payment system, Mercado Pago, had to do all these additional things that slowed down its growth in the early days. But they had a couple of advantages. Uh, they actually hooked up with eBay. They basically took over part of eBay's Latin American business, and that allowed Mercado Libre to be a part of the eBay management meetings. And they basically just went up there and learned everything they could from eBay's example and then figured out how to apply it in Latin America. Also, once they had built out the infrastructure, their actual sales began to accelerate. Again, there's that interesting dynamic. In emerging markets, the growth is slower 
in the earlier stages, but then faster in the later stages, as you now have an infrastructure advantage, much like Amazon did in the early days of e-commerce. So when people say, wow, you know, I look around my market and it's challenging because the infrastructure is not the same as the United States, the payments are not the same as the United States, all these are challenges. But those challenges are opportunities because the people who are able to be the Amazon or Mercado Libre of their market then have enormous advantages later on. The same thing played out in China with Alibaba and Alibaba's ability to create Alipay and its logistics systems and so on and so forth. So do not despair if there are challenges facing you in an emerging market. In the long run, those challenges may end up being your greatest opportunity. Uh, there's a question from Lisansro. A good technique for blitz scaling in a B2B product in a new business sector like AI. So one of the things I would say is that uh, if you've looked at the business to business sector, one of the companies that is a great example, or I didn't put it on this list, but I probably should have, is Slack, which has grown incredibly fast. And what has made Slack so powerful? It has a business to business enterprise SaaS business model coupled with an incredibly viral freemium growth engine. And that is just fascinating, right? Having the ability to uh, tap into viral marketing and viral growth for an enterprise company. That's incredible. And so uh, I think that an interesting opportunity these days is in these hybrid models to look at a new business sector like AI and say, okay, can I apply lessons of freemium? Can I apply the lessons of virality? Can I find ways to be like Slack where I marry the front end of, of the consumer business with a back end that's enterprise SaaS and has that incredible monetization vector? So that's something that I think is really interesting, the consumerization of IT. Uh, Jose asks, uh, let's see. All right. Wow. There's so many, there's so many questions. Okay. Uh, there were questions I missed. Uh, I'll answer this question. Where can I find mentor? How, where can I find mentors who can nudge me in the direction of preparing myself to raise investment in the Boston area? I have accepted this year's MIT Venture Fellow program. However, my mentors are focusing more on my pitch deck and business model. I need to, need to learn how to raise investment. What should I do? So there is a lot of great, by the way, for those of you who are looking to raise money, there's a lot of great material out there on how to raise money. Uh, I myself, Back when I was an entrepreneur and looking to raise money, I really found Guy Kawasaki's book, The Art of the Start, incredibly valuable. Guy is a brilliant author and speaker and self-promoter, and his Art of the Start is a classic book that really talks about how to build a fundraising deck that makes sense. Um, in terms of raising money itself, you know, I think there's a, a lot of information out there. Certainly, I hope I'll try to. If, if that's something that's of interest, we can try to cover it at the boot camp in September. Uh, I would say that my highest level advice for raising money is this: um, the ideal thing to do is to begin developing relationships with investors before, in fact, you ask them for money. And the reason is it's so much easier to ask people you know for money than it is to ask perfect strangers. There's a much greater degree of trust. And so uh, building those relationships has been very helpful. When I've raised money in the past, you know, I've, built, I've done that by basically building relationships with folks. Now, did all those people invest? No. But even where they didn't invest, they often suggested other people to talk with. And that's the other thing. Uh, when you are talking with an investor, the most important thing to do is to also ask them, who else do you think would be interested? And get a couple of additional people to talk with. Uh, investors understand, especially angel investors, if you're at the early stage, that there is safety in numbers. And they try to get other people involved. So if they like you, they'll try to get other people involved. And a lot of the people who have invested in my companies ended up being people who I didn't know personally, but who were friends of friends. And those friends of friends proved to be really critical and over time also became friends themselves. Uh, what about real estate? Are you familiar with Compass? What do you think of them? So there is a lot of fascinating innovation happening in the real estate business right now. It's because real estate, for those of you who've never like tried to buy a home, is insanely full of friction and outdated and people faxing things. I mean, my God. And companies like Compass or Knock, and I was just reading about another one today. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, they're all trying to take friction out of the process. Some of it has to do with uh, the capital requirements. So saying, well, we'll just give you a price for your home. Or in the case of the one I was reading about today, uh, you can make it all, you can work with them to make it all cash off or they'll also help you sell your home afterwards. So that addresses a really screaming need. 
it does also require incredible amounts of capital. So I'm a little skeptical about how it's going to work. I do think that uh, I draw a distinction in the real estate business between uh, plays that are primarily focused on leveraging the extremely cheap capital that's available right now, which may not always be available, especially if we have an economic downturn, and the ones that are truly reducing the amount of friction in the system. And so I would focus on reducing friction in the system. Yes, if money is free, try to take advantage of it, but recognize that money may not stay free forever. It's an old saying that a friend of mine taught me, one of my old mentors, uh, which is that financing is like a cookie jar. Sometimes the cookie jar is open, sometimes it isn't. So when the cookie jar is open, take as many cookies as you can because you don't know when it'll be open again. All right, let me try to cover one or two more companies just because I want to get to uh, an important point, which is that uh, things don't necessarily have to be in the tech industry. So uh, last example I'll use is Zara. Many of you are probably familiar with their clothing, especially if you live in Europe, you've probably experienced it, but anywhere around the world, people are probably familiar with Zara. This is one of the most successful clothing retailers in the world. But ironically enough, it is also a blitz scaling story. And it is an example of how applying speed over efficiency can actually deliver results even for established companies. The thing that makes Zara different from its competitors like H&M and The Gap, who are themselves very successful, very established companies, is their business model. H&M and The Gap focus on making clothing and then selling clothing in their stores. That seems pretty straightforward, right? But Zara turns that model in its head and it's actually been following the same model since its founder, Amancio Ortega, first created the company when he was a teenager in Spain. And the idea behind Zara is they only produce things that they know they can sell. And the way they are able to do this is by investing very heavily in the ability, whoops, my, uh, my uh, keyboard, my, uh, my power cord started to go on the fret, so I had to make sure I had power for my laptop to keep talking with you guys. Uh, so with Amancio Ortega, what he focused on was speed over efficiency. So for example, uh, Zara doesn't do what everyone else does, which is to manufacture their clothes in Asia where labor costs are lower. They manufacture their clothes in Spain. Why do they do that? Because that allows them to get clothes from an idea on the sales floor, i.e. the salespeople are like, people are asking for this item of clothing. When can we get it? The sales floor reports to the design center every single day. So if a salesperson, a bunch of salespeople like, we keep hearing this demand, a designer will design that item that day and it will immediately go into production. Zara keeps all these sort of like what they call grave goods. Gray goods are goods that are not dyed yet. They're just in basically a plain white, off-white color. Uh, and they're already made, so shirts and things like that, just not quite finished yet with all the bells and whistles. And they very quickly finish those off. And Zara can actually get a product from a salesperson saying, hey, customers asking this, to getting it on the sales floor in about one to two weeks. And everyone else is dealing with the order of magnitude months. And that ability to get it onto the floor quickly it costs them because it costs more to manufacture short runs, to do it in Spain, to do it on rush, to fly the clothes out via air cargo instead of shipping them via boat. But what that allows them to do is to basically have zero inventory risk. And most of the uh, most of their competitors like Gap and H&M, as you know, cheap people like me wait for their goods to go on sale and then buy them. Why? Because they produce too much of them. They misread the demand in the marketplace. For whatever reason, they have a bunch of clothes that they have to write down. And that's actually one of the biggest things that hurts their profitability. And Zara just eliminates that by focusing on speed instead of efficiency. Ironically enough, when you focus on speed instead of efficiency, you often end up being more efficient. So we have three minutes left. I'm going to open it up to you guys for questions. You can ask about other companies that I haven't mentioned. Uh, you can ask about other companies that, that I mentioned along the way that you want me to cover. Again, I apologize. I couldn't get to all the companies that I had on my list. I dramatically overestimated my ability to get through it quickly, but hopefully you still got a lot out of it. So. Um, is there any other indication that you're ready for blitz scaling besides understanding that you have product market fit? Or is it just the idea of speed versus efficiency in any stage? Um, understand that you have product market fit. Visibility into how you're actually going to be able to get the capital required to blitz scale. Sometimes we call that blitz capital. Uh, it could be venture capital or it could be your own revenue streams or it could be a partnership or things like that. And of course, as I mentioned, competition. Because the main reason to blitz scale 
is to win the race to being the one who is the first to reach critical scale. If there's no competitors, you can move a little more slowly and efficiently. But what I always like to point out to people is just because you don't think you have competition doesn't mean there isn't someone out there working on the same thing that just hasn't revealed themselves to the world yet. So blitzscaling is generally something you should follow whenever you think you have a valuable market that's winner take most or winner take all, but your competition is going to play a major role in deciding when is the time you really have to step on the gas, a la Airbnb. Um, so Zara, so the, the question, the quest point that Source System ma makes is, if Zara is focusing on fast turnaround time for real-time on-demand design, this sounds like an unsustainable blitz-scaling business model. Is that correct? So the key there is that their blitz-scaling is occurring on a micro level, at the level of the individual clothing item. And that's what they're doing. They're basically saying, I can get this particular hot new thing that people want to the market faster than everyone else. And I can capture that market share ahead of my competitors like Gap and H&M because of that speed. And so it's happening at the microcosm, at the level of the individual clothing item or clothing line. At the macro level, obviously they're still pursuing efficiency. They're an established company. And rest assured that even though it costs more to manufacture in Spain, they still pursue efficiency. And in fact, they've used their financial might to buy an enormous amount of robots and automation to increase their speed and efficiency even further. And so they use things like their capital strength, their financial strength, to actually build barriers to entry that keep other people from matching them. Um, so, Source so Stone asks, uh, with respect to what you're saying now, are you suggesting we need to follow Peter Thiel's zero to one monopoly strategy? So I would say this. First of all, it's very important, uh, especially when dealing with the government, not to use the word monopoly. Peter likes to use that word. Peter loves controversy, as you can tell. Um, but it is true that we increasingly live in a world of winner take most or winner take all markets. And it is better to tackle a market that is wide open than to try to fight it out hand-to-hand -hand combat against an established market. And so that's why it's often important to find some sort of technological innovation that helps you explain why now. What's different? Uh, think about it, right? So uh, people have done things like uh, Airbnb before, but what was the difference? Well, uh, the difference was people getting to the point where smartphones allowed you to do things like, you know, uh, actually communicate with people while you were on vacation. Like uh, Airbnb is not useful if you need to communicate with the host and you have to whip your laptop out of your backpack, somehow connect to a modem in a foreign country and figure out how to, how to get in touch with someone. So the smartphone has enabled so many different things. I suspect that AI will be similar. AI will enable so many new technologies because we'll be able to take things that previously required a lot of human intervention and do them automatically. And so, yes, you should try to find a winner take most or winner take all market where you can dominate and be the big winner. Uh, but the way you find those markets is you look for markets that are going to be disrupted by new technologies because those new technologies are the things that are going to put those markets up for grabs. So we are right at the one hour mark. I apologize that I won't be able to get to more questions. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this session and got a little bit out of some of these case studies of blitz scaling. Uh, I'll turn it back over to the good folks from MIT to close things out. And once again, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your busy days. Chris, thank you so much for wrapping up our fourth and final uh, Global Scaling e-seminar. So thank you so much for that. Um, if any of our attendees have any questions about the bootcamp or about the e-seminar, uh, please reach out to us at bootcamp at mit.edu. And then this recording and the slides will be available uh, early next week. So please check back on our website and you'll be able to see it there. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I think you saw what I mean about the slides, but you know, maybe you do want the slides because you see which other companies I intended to talk about but didn't get time to. Great. Thank you. Thank you.